So today I'm going to be talking about respiratory alkalosis and the conversations that the body makes in order to correct the situation. So we have an acid-base balance in the blood, right? The pH scale is from 1 to 14 with 7 in the middle is neutral. Acids have a higher concentration of hydrogen ions and bases have a higher concentration of hydroxide ions. Neutral will have the same concentration of hydrogen ions as hydroxide ions. So a neutral pH would be 7, which pure water is at a pH of 7. So the normal blood pH in the human body is supposed to be between 7.35 and 7.45. So the enzymes in the blood need specific pHs in order to function. Okay, so it's important that we maintain that range within the body. So any pH less than 7.35 is considered acidosis, right? Because that's closer to the lower end of the pH scale. And then anything higher than 7.45, we consider alkalosis. Okay, so, or alkalotic, because that's closer to the higher end of the pH scale, as you can see right here. So you can see the scale right here of hydrochloric acid, which is in our stomachs or gastric juices. So this goes from most acidic and up to most basic. So right here you have seven, you have pure water, and then just above that you have blood. So, and then more basic, you have baking soda, soap, ammonia, drain cleaner, etc. So the acid-base balance in the blood, say that 10 times fast, is regulated by chemical buffer systems, a respiratory mechanism, and a renal mechanism. And there's a lot more involved in all of that, but just gonna kind of give a basic overview today. Effects of the changes in the concentration of hydrogen ions. So changes in this concentration have effects on nerve function. So an increased concentration of hydrogen ions is gonna give us CNS, central nervous system depression. A decreased concentration of hydrogen ions is gonna give us peripheral nervous system PNS overexcitability, and then later CNS overexcitability. PNS, we're going to have paresthesia or the pins and needles, okay, from the afferent nerves. We're also going to have muscle twitches in the efferent nerves, more severe you know, muscle spasms, and this can lead to respiratory distress. The central nervous system, extreme nervousness, which is less severe, and then getting to more severe, you've got convulsions, seizures, death. So, um, as I mentioned, a marked Increase in free hydrogen ions in the blood, which we would call acidosis, can cause central nervous system depression. While a marked decrease in hydrogen ions, alkalosis, can cause overexcitability in the nervous system. First in the peripheral and then in the central nervous system. So as I mentioned previously, enzymes depend on a certain pH in the blood in order to function properly. So if there's even a slight shift in the hydrogen ion concentration, the enzymes may have a change in shape and the metabolic activity that these enzymes are responsible for can change as well. So respiratory alkalosis, remember this is when we have a marked decrease in hydrogen ions. Okay, We're going to have a greater concentration of hydroxide ions than we are hydrogen ions in the blood. Okay, So to remind you, that's going to be a pH above 7.45 is going to be respiratory alkalosis. Okay, so this happens when we have too much carbon dioxide lost via hyperventilation. So hyperventilation, <laughs> right? Breathing really, really fast. Okay, so not enough carbon dioxide means there's less hydrogen ions formed. This has to do with carbonic anhydrase reactions and the conversion of carbon dioxide into carbonic acid and hydrogen ions. Okay, so when we don't have enough CO2, that process isn't happening. So we're going to have less hydrogen ions hanging out in the blood, which is going to decrease the acidity, increase the alkalinity, right? So when too much carbon dioxide is exhaled in relation to the metabolic requirements of the body, CO2 is being expelled at a rate higher than it is being formed as a result of cellular respiration. Carbon dioxide is necessary in the body, Okay, as I mentioned, as it contributes to the carbonic acid buffer system. Carbon dioxide and water can form carbonic acid, which can dissociate into a hydrogen ion of bicarbonate with the help of carbonic anhydrase. The buffer system works by bicarbonate binding to excess free hydrogen ions to form carbonic acid and then can dissociate into free hydrogen ion and bicarbonate when more hydrogen ions 
needed in order to maintain pH within the normal range. So we don't have enough CO2 in the body because it's being expelled too quickly by hyperventilation. There's less of a source of hydrogen ions if there's not enough carbon dioxide to react with water, blah, 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 blah. This results in a decrease in hydrogen ion concentration, which then corresponds to a rise in pH, as I just mentioned. So, I mean, possible causes of true hyperventilation could include fever, anxiety, obviously, aspirin poisoning, in addition to other possible causes. Each of these conditions can induce hyperventilation without consideration of CO2 levels within the body. Tachypnea, for reference, is an increased breath rate that is paced with the metabolic requirements of the body. Hyperventilation is defined as breathing rates that exceed the body's metabolic needs, leading to a net loss of carbon dioxide. So when I'm breathing, when I'm just sitting here, chilling in my chair, giving a lecture, my metabolic rate is pretty low. Okay, I don't have a very high need for extra oxygen or to expel more CO2. And so as I'm sitting here, my breathing is pretty chill. I'm not breathing heavily. Now, if I were to go exercise, I like to use the Oculus Quest and play Beat Saber. And I get a lot of exercise and I'm breathing heavy and I'm sweating and my metabolic needs are increasing. And so because of that, I need more oxygen, right? So I start breathing faster and I also need to expel more carbon dioxide because my cells are producing that carbon dioxide as waste. My metabolic needs are shifting, right? But if you're hyperventilating and you're just sitting and you don't have the metabolic need for breathing quickly, right, tachypnea, then that's going to be hyperventilation and that can cause this issue of respiratory alkalosis. So clinical presentation of respiratory alkalosis includes a quick respiratory rate, so tachypnea, of greater than 20 breaths per minute, tachycardia, which is a high heart rate, tetany, so that would be like tensing up of the muscles or other muscles, spasms or cramps, EKG changes, paresthesia, that's the pins and needles feeling, or a chivostic sign, which is an involuntary twitch of the nose or lips when you do a strong tap on the jaw. There's videos on YouTube that you can see if you're looking at chivostic sign. So that would be a clinical presentation that would indicate respiratory alkalosis. So compensation. So how does the body deal with this? Our blood pH is increasing. What are we going to do? We need to do something about this. So without any compensation, respiratory alkalosis would show an increase in blood pH as a result of the reduction in carbon dioxide present. So bicarbonate level that remains normal in an alkalotic ratio greater than 20 to 1. Our bodies are masters of homeostasis and we have compensation mechanisms to counteract conditions like respiratory alkalosis. So the first line of defense is the chemical buffer systems present in the body. When pH gets too high, buffer systems release more hydrogen ions to bring down the pH. The second line of defense is a respiratory mechanism. So the rate of external respiration, sorry, that's the breathing in and out, can be adjusted by either slowing down or speeding up ventilation. Ventilation is a fancy word for breathing. The faster the pace, the more CO2 is expelled and more O2 is brought in. The slower the pace, the less O2 is inhaled and the more CO2 is retained. So the third powerful line of defense is the renal mechanism. You think renal, you think kidneys. So in the case of respiratory alkalosis, the type B intercalated tubular cells, say that, 10 times fast, release bicarbonate to be excreted in the urine to bring that top number of the ratio down. So when I'm talking about the ratio, I'm talking about this ratio, this ratio of bicarbonate ions to carbon dioxide. When the alkalotic ratio is greater than 20 to 1, 20 over 1, then your body's going to start compensating for that. So for example, say there's a 50% reduction in CO2, which would take the normal 20 to 1 ratio to 20 over 0.5, which would basically be 40 over 1. So in order to bring the ratio back to normal, if CO2 concentration cannot increase, maybe the patient can't slow down the ventilation rate for whatever reason, the kidneys have the option to release bicarbonate into the urine to bring that top number down which consequently can bring that ratio down to normal. 
closer to the 20 over 1. So basically when all else fails, the kidneys kick in. It's really important that you have your kidneys for more than one reason. So there's a study. There are lots of studies and lots of things. There's a study by Johansson et al. in 2013. A background, basically, there's chronic idiopathic hyperventilation, or CIH, can be difficult to treat effectively. Chronic idiopathic hyperventilation is basically a dysfunctional breathing disorder where the patient is consistently ventilating at a level that exceeds metabolic needs of that person. And then carbon dioxide, once again, is expelled at a rate faster than it is being created by cellular respiration within the tissues. So this creates a, cro- a condition of chronic hypocapnia. Hypo meaning low. Capnia is carbon dioxide. So chronic hypocapnia, low arterial partial pressure of carbon dioxide, less than 4.7 kilopascals. Idiopathic means that the disorder has no known etiology or cause. So we don't know what it is. So chronic happens long term. Usually something is chronic is usually longer than six weeks. Um, idiopathic, we don't know what causes it. And then the hyperventilation is someone who is ventilating beyond the needs of the metabolic um, the better metabolic needs of the body. It's been proposed that individuals with CIH have a lower set point for a partial pressure of CO2, which would increase the drive for ventilation. Whether that lower set point is genetic or acquired is unknown. Uh, it may be possible that an acute hyperventilation episode may permanently lower that set point or arterial partial pressure of carbon dioxide. So basically, like their kind of their baseline might be a little bit different than normal. So clinical presentation of CIH goes shortness of breath and chest tightness as well as paresthesia. Once again, pins and needles, feeling that feeling associated with overexcitability of afferent or sensory neurons. So difficulty exercising, fatigue, exhaustion, a high arterial partial pressure of oxygen, which makes sense because hyperventilation would increase the amount of oxygen taken in within the lungs. Rather large negative standard base excess, which indicates low bicarbonate levels as a result of the renal compensation mechanism that results from chronic hypocapnia. So in this study, their hypothesis was periodically inducing normocapnia in patients with CIH over several weeks through a novel breathing mask will raise resting carbon dioxide levels leading to a reduction in symptoms. So that was kind of their goal, testing this particular device to see if they can bring those levels up to normocapnia. So their methods, the end value was only six. There were only six people in the study, five female, one male. Height, weight, BMI are all within normal ranges, ages between 23 and 56. Seven. They define the patients with CIH as those with capillary CO2 tension of less than 4.7 kilopascals. SBE value was less than negative 1.0. That is more negative. Uh, they excluded patients with an O2 sat less than 95% at rest. So because this was only a preliminary study of this hypothesis, the number of patients in the study was only six. That's pretty typical. You usually, when you're just starting out something, a new treatment or a drug, you start with just a few people to see how things are tolerated before you move on to bigger and better things. So as I mentioned, so patients with the resting oxygen sat of less than 95% were excluded because that would probably indicate that increased ventilation was a result of a compensation for low oxygen levels, perhaps as a result of COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and not truly hyperventilation as defined by breathing rates that exceed metabolic requirements. So if someone has COPD, often their oxygen saturation will be lower than 95% because they have a hard time breathing. And so when that happens, their body body is triggered to breathe more heavily to increase the oxygen saturation. They don't want to discourage that heavy breathing necessarily in patients with COPD because then the oxygen sats could drop even lower. So that's why they would exclude those people from that study. Okay, so this is the breathing apparatus. Looks kind of funky. Honestly, it looks like a jock strap at first, <laughs> at first glance. Uh, no, head strap. Uh, bypass valve, membrane, rebreathing bag. So figure one, the partial rebreathing mask showing the membranes, rebreathing bag, head straps, and bypass valve. So basically the treatment was using this novel partial rebreathing mask to induce normal capnia. They're supposed to wear it for two hours a day for four weeks. Their baseline measurements were capillary blood gases, pH, and standard base excess. They measured it weekly, three hours post-treatment. So interventional treatment involved patients wearing this funky mask in their homes for two hours a day for a duration of four weeks. Baseline measurements were taken before the intervention and then taken weekly three hours after a two-hour treatment session. So other tests performed weekly includes spirometric values, forced vital capacity, breath hold tolerance, or BHT test, and a questionnaire that was used to quantify symptoms of hyperventilation known as the NQ. So results. All right, table one from the study shows that the reference or the normal values for each of the metrics studied. And as we 
can see the baseline values for all the measurements were significantly deviated from normal measurements. Okay, so here's a reference value of what you should see for these different values. So you've got partial pressure as the capillary partial pressure of carbon dioxide, normal value would be 5.4. The baseline value here was only 3.96, so that's a hypocapnia, low carbon dioxide. And the end of treatment value is 4.41, an absolute change of almost 0.5, the p value is listed here. So pH baseline 7.402, their baseline value is 7.45, so on the alkalotic end of what it should be. So in a treatment value, got it down to 7.43. Reference value for SBU would be 0.48, and theirs was negative 3.8, so it's below that negative one. And end of treatment value is still below negative one, at negative 2.3, but it was a little bit better. Uh, BHT reference value 58, baseline value 18, and in a treatment value 22. The NJ score was 12, should be 12 for reference value. Theirs was 23.8. At their baseline, and end of treatment was 20.7. So there was a change in the right direction for that. Only four out of the six people completed the study. Often in studies, you have people drop out for whatever reason. One patient normalized their partial pressure of, uh, their capillary partial pressure of carbon dioxide, SB and pH values by the third week, okay? Uh, one patient was withdrawn for reasons unrelated to study, which was the only male, and no adverse events were reported, which is always. So their conclusions, the mass treatment reduced metabolic pH compensation uh, and a less negative SBE value, as I mentioned. Normal carbon dioxide resting point can be changed, so there's really no fixed that point. So they were able to kind of change that set point in these in these subjects. Follow-up was definitely needed. Super low sample size, right? That's one of the, the drawbacks of preliminary studies is really low sample size. They would need to adjust the treatment period. Probably a longer period of treatment might be helpful. Measure the carbon dioxide levels and adjust the valves to achieve normocapnia. So adjust the valves off that breathing apparatus. So the mask might be useful for acute hyperventilation episodes to restore normal pH and CO2 levels. If you have ever hyperventilated for whatever reason, someone's like, grab a paper bag, breathe into a paper bag. That's really a rudimentary version of this mask. Bringing a paper bag up to your mouth and breathing in and out of it as you're hyperventilating, you're going, it's going to help you rebreathe some of that carbon dioxide that you're exhaling so that you can get that balance back. I remember a friend of mine, God, we were probably six, and she was running down the hall. I don't know what we were doing. We were gymnastics or something. She was running down the hall, and for whatever reason, she just, like, slipped and just fell straight on her back and knocked the wind out of her. And then uh, she was hyperventilating, and I remember her mom brought her paper bag to, to rebreathe into in order for her to calm down. It worked, apparently. She's still alive and kicking. Anyways, so that is the end of that presentation. I hope that was helpful. If you have any questions, please leave questions in the comments. Let me know. Shoot me a message. Love to answer any questions anyone has. And I hope that was helpful.